About two years ago, I moved into a new apartment. The walls were very thin, and because of the fire safety laws in my city, my bedroom had one window, which led into the living room, and none with outside access. The window will be important later. It was three bedrooms, one for me, one for my master tenant, and one spare, which at the time was rented out by a pretty friendly guy. Well, friendly guy had issues with his work visa and had to move back to Canada last minute, leaving us about two weeks to find another roommate. Our quickest and easiest option was Craigslist. Due to my work schedule, I had no part in the selection process, but was content when the new roommate moved in a little later. He seemed a bit off, but friendly. He was a very tall, large guy, but pretty quiet, and not someone I wanted to go out of my way to hang with, but was okay to be around and be cordial with. About two weeks into his move-in, the master tenant left for Hawaii, leaving him and I alone in the home for the month-long duration of his stay. For the first few days, things are normal. All of a sudden, about four days into the trip, I am woken up about 8 a.m., to a frantic knocking at my door. Roommate, we'll call him Kyle, is standing there when I open up, looking frazzled. He looks me dead in the eye and says, So do you want to tell me what went on last night? To which, I was shocked and confused, because I had come home from work about 9pm and immediately showered and went to bed. I explain this to him, and he tells me that he heard me screaming and arguing with someone in my room. Then he saw me in the side alley, out of the window, arguing with our landlord, whom I'd never seen at that point, that he heard people coming in and out of the house. I tell him no way. None of that ever happened. After staring at me for a little longer, he leaves and doesn't bring it up again. The next morning, I wake up to the same thing. This time, he says he saw me arguing with my boyfriend. I was single at the time had seen me talking with our other roommate, who's in Hawaii, and asked me for the badge number to the officer I'd spoken to, since he had apparently seen me talking to a bunch of police as well. This time, I get angry, and more or less tell him to cut it out, because I'm not doing anything, and I don't know what he's talking about. He gets a weird look on his face and says, I think I had my seizure in my sleep. The next time it happens, call an ambulance and he leaves for a bit, only to start knocking again about an hour later. And when I open up, Kyle repeats this exact same story, verbatim. This happens once more, before I tell him to leave me alone and leave for work. I go to work as normal, and I am reluctant to return that night, but I'm too tired to switch to an alternate location. Big mistake. About 1am, I wake up to slamming doors. Kyle is pacing back and forth between his bedroom, the living room, and out the front door, walking in and out of each room, turning the lights on and off, mumbling angrily and slamming the doors. I can see his figure pacing back and forth through the frosted window in my room that leads to the living room. Since my room is dark, he cannot see inside. Suddenly he screams, I can't live like this. Why are you doing this to me? I think he's on the phone, and don't respond. A few moments later, he screams my name repeatedly, and I realize he's directing it towards me. I knew I had to get out of there, so I very quietly creep out of bed, and start getting dressed, and packing a bag of clothes for work in the morning. I'm almost done, when he screams, I hear you, and charges over to my room. Slapping the wall next to my door, but not touching the door itself. I look towards my window and see his shadow lean all the way forward, pressing his ear against the glass. I was terrified and sat completely still, unmoving. He eventually screams my name again and moves away from the window, and I hear him start pacing between rooms again. Now, my shoes are kept on the rack outside my door and not inside my room. So I know that when I leave, I'm going to need a moment to put them on. I decide to wait until his pacing takes him to the front door again. At which time, 
I plan to grab my shoes, put them on, and run. As I'm formulating this plan, pacing stops. He screams, Do you want to fight about this? Come out right now, and we'll fight. I swear to God. I'm very small. I'm a five-foot girl. And this guy is easily three times my size. So I'm definitely not looking to fight, thanks. After a few minutes, he turns off all the lights, and I hear the door to his room open and close, followed by silence. I wait for a moment to be sure I can't hear any movement, and then decide to take my chance. I took a breath, and pulled my door open quickly. I step out and grab my shoes, before I look up a second later, and see him standing, shirtless, with just a pair of boxes and socks on. In the dark of the hallway, his arms hung slightly outward, in an awkward position. He says in a low, calm voice, Ma'am, we need to talk. That was a hard no from me. So I grab my shoes and run out the door with them in hand. I run about half a block barefoot, before I stop to put them on. When I look back, he's standing in the porch light of our front door, watching me run, but not moving. Luckily, I had a friend who lived two blocks away, and I had their spare key, so I let myself in and crashed there for the night. And that's where I stayed for the next week or so while working things out with the master tenant. And Kyle agreed to move out within the week. He says he doesn't remember anything that happened, or wasn't sure if it was real or not, but if I said that's what went down, then it must be real. The day Kyle left, he sends me a photo of the house keys sitting on the table and says I'm out, nothing else. I take a friend over there with me to scout it out and ensure he's actually left. When we get there, we discover that not only had he left a ton of food and furniture, but he had ripped out all of the fire alarms out of the ceilings. He had unscrewed and removed the deadbolt to the front door and left them lined up neatly on the front table. We then realize that my front door can only lock using a key from the outside, and it had been locked from the outside when we arrived, meaning Kyle still had a key. We called a locksmith immediately, even after changing the locks. I was still terrified to stay there alone afterwards, and never went to sleep at night without barricading the doors with chairs and other furniture. To this day, I still fear for his safety. He was obviously psychologically unstable, but also wonder what could have happened if I hadn't been so lucky as I was. I just started my freshman year of college. I'm going to a college out of my home state, and no one I know is going to the same university as me. Which means I'm rooming with a total stranger. Normal, right? That's what I thought when I met my roommate, who I will be referring to as DJ from now on. She seemed nice though, her parents seemed nice enough. Everything was going fine for the first couple of weeks, but then DJ's odd habits began emerging. I noticed that every time I would sit at my desk, she would move from wherever she was to sit on the floor behind me, every time. The first few times, I thought it was just coincidental because it happened when she would just be entering the room from her last classes. I thought maybe she just wanted to relax by sitting on the floor. Weird, yes, but plausible. But no, then the other scenarios began happening. She has a beanbag sat right next to me, so close that I'm touching it, and this is her favorite spot. She always sits there to do her homework and whatnot. If I decide I want to sit at my desk, she actually will move from the beanbag to the floor behind me. Sometimes she doesn't even do anything. She just sits there. She abandons her homework to sit behind me. I don't sit at my desk too often anymore for this reason. DJ has a job that she has to get done by 8am every weekday, which means I typically get woken up early, which is fine. I usually just roll over and try to get some extra sleep. A few times now though, I have woken up to DJ staring at me. One time, she was a foot away from my bed, 
just staring. She also makes a point to look at me when she leaves. But it doesn't end there. I am utterly disgusted by hair, right? It actually makes me sick to my stomach to see hair all over the floor. Well, DJ has this long curly red hair, which is fine, only she sheds so much, and I've seen her sitting there and pull her hair out. Okay, whatever. But one day, I decided I wanted to wash my sheets. I don't even sleep with my sheets. I'll either sleep with a throw blanket or only my comforter. I never go under my sheets, but I lay on top of them, so they still deserve to be washed. When I pulled back the sheet, I was met with DJ's long curly hair. I about threw up. I have no clue how it got there, and I'm not sure I want to know. It gets better. On Tuesdays and Thursdays, DJ and I share the same last class together. When class ends, she sits there and waits for me to pack up my notebooks and things. And then we walk back to our dorm room, together. Only here's what's strange. She never tries to talk to me. She just walks two feet behind me. By itself, that seems kind of normal. But with everything else, it just sort of feels like she's watching me. Perhaps not the most creepy story out there, but it's definitely a little unnerving to me. This is a story about a roommate that my boyfriend and I had many years ago, when we first started college. His name was Bob. We'd been friends with this guy for about a year. He was a character with a lot of interesting quirks, but nothing that seemed really dangerous at first. First of all, he was amazingly creative. He was a great artist and could also pick up a musical instrument he never played and figure it out in a couple of hours which was very impressive. He had an amazing ability to focus. One crazy thing he would do was to pick flies straight out of the air. He'd get this intense look on his face as he watched the fly, then he'd slowly approach it and bam, pinch it out of the air in mid-flight. He also liked to burn things. Often, we'd be kicking back and suddenly there'd be a smell of burning hair or something. There he would be, sitting over the ashtray, burning something he'd found, with that same intense look of concentration on his face. Once, someone brought over this big stand-up cardboard Easter bunny. We didn't have it for an hour before we noticed smoke coming from the front yard. There he was, watching the bunny burn. In retrospect, there were some things that indicated something was wrong with him, beyond his quirky behavior. A couple of times he accidentally hurt my dog, shut his leg in the door, or carelessly grazed him with a lit cigarette. Once, when he was cat-sitting for a girlfriend, the cat mysteriously disappeared. A girl I knew claimed that he had tried to bury her puppies under a shed. They liked to crawl under there to sleep, and he filled in the entrance. But he and she had kind of a weird history, so I believed him when he denied it. So, one day, some friends of ours came by the house while we weren't home. They caught him picking up and throwing one of our dogs, hurting her for fun. I confronted him over this, as I was naturally pretty upset. He told me, in a completely matter-of-fact way, that he decided to conduct an experiment that he had been working on for a while. He wanted to see... If he gave my dogs only bad attention and pain, whether they would learn to enjoy it. He acted like this was a totally rational explanation. I told him that this was crazy, and asked him where he'd come up with such a horrible excuse for torturing my dogs. After some argument, he admitted that while he was doing an experiment, he really did enjoy seeing the look of fear in their eyes when he hurt them. He also admitted that he had similar desires to do the same to women, though he hadn't acted on them. Again, with these confessions, he didn't seem at all remorseful. He said it all in the same tone, that you typically tell someone you decide to take some painting classes or something mundane like that. 
Needless to say, we made Bob move out and stopped hanging out with him. I don't know what he did to our dogs when we weren't at home for the six months he lived with us. I did hear from a mutual friend that when he found out our dog had puppies, and he was surprised that she could get pregnant after what he did to her. Pretty disgusting. I wouldn't be surprised to see his name in the papers as being a serial killer. Or something, someday. This was back in 2012, but it still gives me the heebie-jeebies when I think about it. I had just gotten out of a bad relationship and was living with my grandparents, hunting for apartments, and I found a house that was only a few blocks from the group home I work at. I thought, great, even in the snowy weather, I'd still be able to walk to work. I called the number on the Craigslist ad and set a time to check it out. I boogie on over, and I'm greeted by a man in his mid-thirties. He seems very awkward at first, but showed me around and said if things work out, I could take my pick of either of the available rooms. He started making small talk and was becoming increasingly weird. He was asking me questions about how old I was, if I smoked pot, if I was single. Not totally red flags, but the way he came off was weird nonetheless. I say I have to go, and he gives me the email of the homeowners. Turns out, it was his girlfriend's parents' place. So I dawdle on home and email the couple, giving my references and income information, as one does. A couple of days later, the husband calls me, and says hastily that the rooms are no longer available. I'm a little miffed. But what can I do about it, right? Cut to a week later. My friend and I are hanging out, smoking pot and just shooting the shit. I can't remember how it came up, before she mentioned that there was a website where you can see all the registered sex offenders. Of course our curiosity takes over, and we look it up. I think you know where this is going. We scroll and scroll, and eventually, apartment man. My jaw drops and I can't believe what I'm seeing. His charges? Incest with a minor. I don't know if anything would have happened, but I'm glad the homeowners turned me down. And what dumb luck that I stumbled across this website a week after. This happened in 2009 and landed me in no end of trouble in my anime community. I moved to an apartment with a friend of mine. Worst mistake. The guy was popular and pretty much loved. While I just wanted to run panels at a local convention and just enjoy myself. So far, I was doing fine, having a job Monday to Saturday at my college bookstore and also trying to get through the senior year of college. I was doing fine until around February. That was when my roommate... Might as well dub him House Cat. Lost his job. I lost mine soon after and had to drop out to find a job. Because of this, I was made to float him. He started to become very negative and lashed out at a friend of mine. It freaked us all out and I went to stay with a friend. I had two interviews, one with a local temp agency and another at a library. I took the temp job right away, but it was not fast enough. Housecat made living at the apartment a nightmare. Eventually, I had to get the cosigner involved, my dad, and he and I evicted Housecat. I was nervous for months because afterward I jumped at shadows because Housecat became very angry at me, at my sister, and my family in general. His girlfriend was no help either because they blamed me for everything. This had repercussions for me. I was blacklisted from most parties, which was fine. I also lost a lot of friends because of this, and barely had anyone to trust. Basically, people have said because of Housecat, I now have PTSD, and still get jumpy. 
I also hate being home by myself. When he was living with me, the friend he lashed out at, he knocked the floor, and he was holding her down. I was in the bathroom to cool off, and ran out when I heard the scream. I grabbed my phone and charger, while my friend's dad came to get us. We had just returned from a friend's graduation party. I was stunned and scared of house cat. Also what made the situation worse was that I have several allergies to certain foods, which also can be found in beer. I cannot have it and couldn't afford EpiPens or medical at the time. I was terrified because house cat flaunted this in front of his friends, which made me stay in my room most nights. One of his girlfriends decided to sneak soda into my room, which I downed while playing on my PlayStation 1 and also my Nintendo 64. The day he was evicted, I was training at my temp job and I was not home. He called from his father's phone to demand I come back to the apartment. When I got back, the bed, his computer, and stereo were gone. My new roommates arrived after and I was relieved. So Housecat, I hope we never meet again. As for the Colorado anime community, thanks for nothing. I needed help, and you clearly value popularity over mental health. I'm glad I will never be part of that again. I still like anime though. When I was an undergrad here in the US, I lived with my good friend, Jim. Gentrification had improved the city around the campus, but it was still dangerous. The, in quotes, safe zone had expanded to include a few blocks around the campus where our house was located, but you still avoided walking alone at night. To better understand what happened, I have to give you the layout of the house. You enter into the living room with my roommate's bedroom immediately to your left and a hallway straight across from the door. Halfway down the hallway, there's a bathroom to your right. The hallway ends with the kitchen on your right and my room on the left. Our bedrooms share a wall. I'm in my room one night and I hear some loud noises in the living room. Assuming that Jim has the television cranked too high, I walk to the living room to tell him off. I see what appears to be my roommate, but in his jacket, and he walks briskly out the door. Same height, same navy blue windbreaker, shock of black hair and khakis. The only thing that didn't add up was that the door was already ajar when he walked away and he didn't bother to close it. So I yell after him, Hey, Jim, where are you going? A voice from the bathroom responds, Who are you talking to? My stomach drops and I realize that the person who just left our apartment wasn't my roommate. Jim comes out of the bathroom and doesn't believe me. It isn't until he finds his wallet missing that he realizes that we've been robbed. Furthermore, we find several cables on the couch and we realize that the burglar had been in the process of unhooking our TV when I caught him. I later joked to my dad that I wish I had come out of my room sooner to stop him, but he pointed something out that chilled me. Our door was definitely locked, a habit from living where we lived. And even if it wasn't, there was no way the guy didn't know we were home. Jim was in his room a mere minute ago and the lights were on. This was a guy who didn't care about locks or occupants and therefore could be very dangerous if cornered. So, weird roommate doppelganger who robbed us. I hope we never meet again. I recently acquired a new roommate. The entire situation should never have happened, but I needed someone to help with rent. So a Craigslist posting later, he moved in. His name was Greg, 
and he discloses to me that he did have some strange sleeping behaviors, sleep talking, sleepwalking, and night terrors. Funny thing was, I also had a history of sleepwalking, but only on rare occasions. The first incident occurred about one week later when I heard him screaming in the middle of the night. Since we both slept in separate rooms on different sides of the house, the scream sounded distant, but enough to scare me so much that I ran to check on him. As I'd get closer to his bedroom, he stopped screaming, so I just went back to bed. For the next month, he had no issues. I noticed he had no friends or family that would visit, and I never saw or heard him on the phone, or even text. Then another random night, Greg started screaming. Same thing. I got up and started to go to his room, but he'd stopped. Then one night, I was awoken by screaming in my bedroom. I couldn't see anything in the panic, so I turned on the bedside lamp, and he was at the foot of my bed wearing shorts and a t-shirt. He scared me, so I started screaming and woke him up. He apologized and went back to bed. Then, the scariest thing happened. About two nights later, I was woken up to clanking. It sounded like tools and hammers tapping. I turned on the lights to see Greg kneeling down in a corner, working on something with his hands. A few seconds after turning the light on, Greg froze then slowly turned his upper body around and stared blankly at me while I laid in bed. I was beyond creeped out, so I slowly slid out of bed and left the house. After sleeping in my truck down the road in an empty church car park, I returned to the house at 8 in the morning. Greg was gone. All of his belongings were gone too. No signs of him anywhere. It was like he never lived there. I didn't know any of his friends or family, so I had no one to call about him. Days turned into weeks, weeks into months. When I moved out after the lease was up, I was moving furniture out of my bedroom. In the corner of the room, where I last saw Greg kneeling down, I realized the floor vent for the air conditioning was loose. Inside the floor vent was an envelope with a ton of pictures of me sleeping. There were dates and times written on the back of the photos. The only other item left behind was a whittled down broom handle brought to a point. I truly believe Greg was planning to kill me that night, and he realized it. It was the sleepwalking Greg that was going to do it. He left to save my life. It appears Greg had been coming to my room almost nightly and working on making the broom handle into a stabbing weapon. And I never heard until the last night I saw him. Hey guys, today's a pretty special episode. We've come up to our first milestone, 1,000 subscribers. So thanks guys. I appreciate all the love and support you've given me. I hope you've enjoyed today's episode with Night Terrors. He'll be releasing a video soon with me in it. The link is in the description. Head over to Night Terrors and give him some love. Don't forget to like and comment too, and follow me on my socials. All the links are in the description. And again, guys, it means a lot to me. Let's just continue building this community. Let's keep all the positivity and make everyone feel welcome. So on that note, I'll catch you in the next one.